scheduled. Ah. Ah. Yes. Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the third artist talk of the Hostess Artistic Residency, the second season. Today, uh, I am joined by, we are joined by, me and Carmen are joined by Suzanne Kite. Um, a little bit of about the residency and ourselves. So I'm Eja Tankal and Carmen Aguilar Wedge. We are running a small design studio called Hyphen Labs in which we investigate coincidences, fantasies, and so, <clears throat> sometimes, I um, mean, well, oftentimes, absurdities that happen at the crossroads of new emerging tech and with our present and the future. Uh, we are the hosts for the second season, The Host Is, which is a hybrid residency program initiated by Kampnagel and Dr. Holland in Hamburg. Our season is called Anything to Declare. And in our season, we it's actually uh, towards the end of our season, we'll be presenting it um, at the end of this month in Hamburg. And throughout the season, we explored and tried to redefine real and imagined boundaries at the digital and physical borders of our everyday existences. Um, and our projects broadly include a post-detonative geo future, a speculative hardware inspired by Caribbean culture, and an anti-capitalistic utopia for counter economies. Um, we are opening on the 15th of December and we'll be happy to see you there. And now I will give the mic to Carmen so she can introduce Suzanne. Hello. Uh, great to see you guys all again, and we're really excited to have Suzanne Kite here today. She is a performance artist and visual artist and composer raised in Southern California with a BFA from Cal Arts in Music Composition, an MFA from Bard College Milton Avery Graduate School, and is a PhD candidate at Concordia University. She's currently a 2019 Pierre Elevit Trudeau Foundation Scholar and a research assistant for the Ass Initiative for Indigenous Futures. Her research is concerned with contemporary Lakota epistemologies through research creation, computational media, and performance practice. Recently, Kite has been developing a body of work for interface for movement performances, carbon fiber sculptures, immersive video and sound installations, as well as co-running the experimental electronic imprint Unheard Records. So we're su super grateful to have you here and excited to learn more about your practice. So whenever you're ready, um, you can throw us backstage and take it away. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me. So, um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so here that goes. Um, again, my name is Suzanne Kite. Um, I'll start by saying um, it's morning here. So he hani wash day. Suzanne Kite amacha pikushto. Oglala hamacha. Chante wash day na pe chiyuzapo. Muskogee Creek Reservation, LOT, which is also known as Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I, I do a lot of things in my practice, but primarily I'm an artist and I have spent a long time thinking through the movement of data through computational systems, uh, through sonification, visualization, and what I call tactilization. And I bring this back to the concept my grandfather speaks about um, when he, when I asked how one makes a new song in the Lakota way, um, he points to his throat. An understanding of learning songs is listening while hearing, while creating, while knowing, while channeling. <clears throat> I've been, uh, I think the word that I would use in Lakota is kara, which is like um, kind of composing, creating, uh, uh, manifest like enacting uh, relationships, that sort of thing. <clears throat> so, uh, just to introduce my my practice, I make these body interfaces. Some of the early ones, and I do this in order to give um, a way for me to put feedback, um, in, in human and build a human computer interaction system with uh, my computational system. So, <clears throat> this is James Hurwitz who built my first 
body interface using open source software you can see here and like handmade um, Arduinos. And uh, this was uh, almost like about 10 years ago now. And uh, I was able to start making performance works, uh, exploring the relationship between myself and the bo body interface and the computational system, and then eventually artificial intelligence, um, machine learning, and the system. So I'll just uh, play a little bit of some of the music and performance work that was originally made. So uh, that work has evolved over time to become sculptural practice, embroidery practice, and I'll come back to these embroideries. But I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, a line of thinking about the inclusion of non-humans in our relationships uh, to the world, especially to artificial intelligence. So um, I really like this idea of, um, I, I don't usually engage with a borderlands theory, um, but I do see how it's applicable to relationships um, uh, that are inherently ontological. So um, the status of who is a being, what is a being, uh, and then how one makes all decisions and societies are built, languages are built, entire philosophies created, in, um, built on ex uh, the, ex you know, the extreme clarity with which uh, we as humans are able to articulate who is a being and who is not, who is excluded um, and who is not. So um, I, I consider this like a non-human future. So understanding that humans uh, are already surrounded by objects which are not understood to be intelligent or alive, so they're un seen as unworthy of relations. So I always want to ask how human can even create uh, a future with relations between technology or AI without an ethical ontological orientation with which to understand who is my relation and who is not, who can be a relation and who cannot. So in order to create relations with any non-human entity, even uh, especially those which seem human, the first step is to understand and know that non-human beings are being in the first place. And with that, indigenous ontologies, uh, so ontologies which are engaged with the cosmos and the land, uh, already exist to understand forms of being outside of humanity in an ethical way. So in that way, indigenous ontologies are essential tools for humanity to create relations with the non-human. But of course, it's ignorant and unethical to employ these concepts and divorce them from their context. Those, those lands and cosmos are necessary. Um, the unseen realm of our communications uh, with the universe are necessary. Uh, you can't just take these concepts and move them anywhere and apply them to anything. Uh, that's not how ethics remains. Ethics is generated from uh, re those relationships with the land and cosmos themselves. Uh, I really like this Vine Deloria quote. Um, it goes, respect involves two attitudes. One attitude is the acceptance of self-discipline by humans and their communities to act responsibly towards other forms of life. The other attitude is to seek to establish communications and covenants with other forms of life on a mutually agreeable basis. I really like this term covenants. It um, returns um, for me again and again. 
uh, because when we talk about relationships with the non-human world, they're established in indigenous communities through covenants, through um, treaties, nation to nation relationships. And by nation to nation, I mean human to non-human nation relationships. So um, this manifests in different communities in different ways, but in uh, Lakota communities, we really see the, the Lakota nation as a nation, the bison nation as a nation, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so, of course, these uh, manifestations of uh, ontological status and beinghood have political implications. Uh, so, for me, this isn't a question of if machines deserve to be entities um, or artificial intelligence uh, shows enough intel intelligence to be an entity to be deserving of respect or beinghood, but it's a question of which ontologies we choose to shape our worlds um, and wh what those ontologies um, lead us towards in terms of ethics. So uh, I, the Dylan Rainforth quote is from the essay, How Aborigines Invented the Idea of Object-Oriented Ontology. Um, Dylan writes, object mastery and territorial possession are part and parcel of the processes of genocide. So um, for me, this means that land or location, when we reduce it to the status of an animate object incapable of intelligence or agency, become resources to use and discard. Uh, so I, I want to pause here on, in this presentation. I'm going to show um, a, a little bit of a video and, and I'll talk about it. So this is a video, this is a film I've recently almost completed, um, which is three dreams that I had. So Lakota art forms that are practiced today very clearly communicate visual and philosophical sovereignty, um, which is a, a visual sovereignty is a term coined by uh, Jolene Ricard, Tuscarora scholar and artist. Um, and the, the sovereignty is maintained through relationships with non-humans in the spirit world through the process of dreaming and visioning. Um, uh, this is a quote from David Posthumus, who's a, an ethnographer. He writes, dreams and visions were key avenues for social interaction with non-human spirit persons through whom humans acquire knowledge, which is in Lakota called washlolie, and power, uh, wawashake, in the form of medicine, pejuta. So communication with non-humans in dreams is considered to be more real than waking life, hence a common phrase in Lakota and Dakota, as clear as a vision. And in Lakota, the vision and dream are the same word, ihambla. And um, so he, this is how one communicates. So it's knowledge was sought in dreams and communicated in the waking world. Uh, Posthumus says that the virtual reality of dreams provided access to the domain of the non-human spirit persons because they are pure interiorities where appearances are not what they seem. So to me, this um, primacy of interiority, uh, the possible uh, beinghood of other beings means that the spirit world is the clearest channel of knowledge with which humans can access. So for me, the uh, knowledge creation as an artist means that artists are given the designs for their artwork in, in dreams or visions. And again, this idea of composing with the body, the body as a channel. Um, uh, I think it was Frank Fool's Crow who uh, considered the body um, a bone whistle um, for knowledge to move through. 
so this is also um, applies to this really interesting mythological character of double woman um, who gave women, people who do women's style work, um, mysterious um, abilities in the arts and crafts, particularly for quill work practice. Um, and this was conferred by non-human spirits encountered in dreams and visions. So most of my work has kind of moved towards thinking about this border between the human and the non-human world, um, nation to nation communication, uh, the, especially through song and song is one of those art forms that is very, I, I really, as a composer, I'm a little biased, but I think it's a very interesting way, um, of how clear it is when kind of this inspiration comes like a lightning bolt or slowly it forms in the mind. But can we really say as artists or creators or writers or thinkers that all ideas come from us? Um, I, I really admire the Lakota concept of pitifulness of, as a human being um, and feeling pitifulness is the great, is like the access point to these experiences. Um, uh, feeling that one needs to be pitied by great forces greater than themselves. And this is very much not in a Christian way. It's, it's very, very different from uh, Christian forms of, um, a create like a God knowledge. So songs, um, there's two kinds of songs in Lakota communities. Of course, in the contemporary world, things get very blurred. Like, things are always complex and blurred. But we have songs made by man and songs that come in dreams or visions from the spirit world. Um, you know, these are some of the songs are meant to please the ear. Um, some of those are meant to express feelings. Um, but some of them are are different, uh, where the songs are come from an unknowable place. And knowability and unknowability is, I think, key to uh, the difference, the epistemological difference between uh, non-human um, knowledge that comes through us and the sort of scientific positivism that's been... Um, forced on peoples all around the world uh, following the Western European Enlightenment period. Um, so in this way, I've kind of started to think about my approach to artificial intelligence and uh, making artwork as the possibility that non-human beings, whether they're stones, melted stones, uh, formed into objects, which are which is what I consider computers now, or sort of more complex systems that uh, humans tend to uh, view as having an interiority, even though they might not. So artificial intelligence is kind of has this projected uh, humanity on it. Um, but instead to start to think about how knowledge moves at all, how things are known um, on a very uh, rudimentary level, um, are the question is are artists vessels, um, are humans vessels, and I, I asked this to um, an artist and a geologist, uh, John Dwayne Gosen Center, and he told me quote um, uh, that he does consider um, artists to be hollow bones or the vessel that creator power comes through. So when I think about uh, non-human beings, I try to think about how I can um, approach them in um, with the values that I want to approach anything with, with reciprocity um, and with respect. So I want to talk a little bit about this sculpture uh, called Ian Ie or Telling Rock. And uh, we consider this, this is made by myself and Devin Ronneberg. We consider this to be made of song, power, sound, machine learning decisions, handmade circuitry, gold, silver, copper, aluminum, silicon, and fiberglass. So these are, this is, that's how I'm um, kind of conceptualizing the pathway of electricity through this object, through the handmade circuitry. Uh, and this is a view from below. You can see this is, um, very a first version of it and 
Uh, these are um, synthetic lights, uh, LED lights wrapped around synthetic hair braids. And uh, the software in this system listens to audio changes that are being made um, by the movement of the hair braids and uses machine learning, uses Wekinator to make decisions about how and when to change the video playing through the light constellation. And this came from a vision of my grandfather's where he told me the story that of himself crying for a vision uh, for days, um, which is a common practice, um, and looks out. he looked out over the hill, and in broad daylight he saw a man, a woman, and a horse um, with flowing hair, and kind of an infinity of constellations bursting through the strands. And he suggested that I make art about that. So in this pro, this is kind of, this is just a mock-up we were working on. Um, in this process, we were trying to set up a sense of relationality um, and communication between the human and the, and the uh, sculpture and the gallery. But the thing is, um, you know, we we spent a long time in conversation with my uh, cousin Corey Stover, asking how it we could start imagining processes or methodologies to approach computational systems in an ethical way. And Corey suggested thinking about the metals in these as having a ghost, perhaps a ghost wrenched from the earth, and suggested listening for its name, possibly asking for forgiveness for the process it was removed from the ground. And this opened up. Um, um, a lot of possibilities for us about listening beyond trying to subvert the mind, um, trying to hear inner songs um, coming from other things, but through us. And while most of this is is like a kind of a, you know, just a very uh, preschool level attempt at trying to do these sort of things, um, it was interesting me to me to try to make a generative, like work on a methodology, try to make um, artwork in and trying to do it in an ethical way, even though that um, work is, this work is an inherently a failure um, at ethics at all because of the nature of the materials that we're using and the tools by which we're doing it. But that doesn't mean that um, we shouldn't try and see where those borders are between ethics and uh, failure of ethics. So I'll, I'll play you what it kind of sounds like. This is a version that was online during the pandemic. Um, and you can sort of hear the what it, what it does sound like in the gallery. Um, so if you're interested in more of this artificial intelligence work, um, there we have some papers online. This is uh, Making Kim with the Machines, co-written with uh, Jason Lewis, Noelan Arista, and Archer Pachawas, and myself. And I have this position paper on... Um, Indigenous Protocols and Artificial Intelligence, which was made by many, many people. Um, and uh, yeah, they're wonderful resources. So uh, I'm going to move on from talking about um, AI to talking about more of kind of what I'm currently thinking about. So I, when I was trying to conceptualize uh, how I could apply ontological beinghood to the process of making art, it became a, a question of, of really of methodology and what kind of methodologies um, could I use and what were methodologies were other artists using in order to um, move their work through the world in a way, in a good way, in a way that made them feel like they were um, honoring their values. And uh, this is the kind of way I've been conceptualizing it. Um, and these illustrations were collaboration with um, designer uh, Bobby Joe Smith. Uh, and so, okay, so in these, we have this kind of star of knowledge in the middle. Uh, and 
on one end there is a kind of this plus sign, the star, and the other end is this symbol that we were using for Earth. And I imagine that um, what I call the cosmology scape, which is also after Jolene Ricard's use of it, um, I imagine that human acts of creation are always in collaboration with the non-human world and and that world being both seeable and knowable and physical and unseeable, unknowable and non-physical in the non-human realm, in the spiritual world. And this cos this relationship between cosmos and land, which again, which I call the cosmology scape, uh, is the all-encompassing arena for the creation of movement of new knowledge uh, from the non-human world into, into the human world. So um, I, I imagine all of these stars and um, interactions um, as points of protocol, so indigenous protocols um, which uh, enact reciprocity, um, have our millennia old um, traditions of doing things, and I never see traditional actions, um, as long as they're not harmful towards others, I, I do not see them as, um, as uh, uh, superstitious, that's the word I'm looking for, uh, or silly or anti-logic, um, but as having such deep uh, relationships with non-humans around us and in the places these protocols were developed, um, that sometimes we, uh, they outlive our oral history, or they've been destroyed by other epistemological systems. So instead, I see the offering of tobacco, which is a common action um, in uh, North American communities, and the uh, the feasting of objects, the feasting of other beings, uh, to thank them and be grateful to them as all part of the actions that indigenous artists and performance artists take while moving new knowledge into the world. So then. Um, then in this orb here, I see as all of the possibilities of interaction um, that we can't even know about when one sets off a chain reaction of trying to do something in a good way, of offering tobacco, of feasting, of being reciprocal in one's actions. And finally, I um, I started to imagine these are these are all these um, sideways capemnies, these twisting vortexes, but they're on their sides here. And this these words they say. Um, Listening to non-humans on earth and the spirit world leads to knowing how non-humans create new knowledge. And so this was my way of moving against the concept of, of kind of a tiered movement of knowledge. I, I, I didn't want to put ontology, epistemology, meth, methodology, cosmology. I wanted them all to be um, uh, interacting with, e with each other, where all of those things in indigenous methodologies and indigenous creation are one um, orb of movement of knowledge and decision making. So uh, this um, uh, this work kind of uh, became a, a project I presented last December, and it uh, was presented at um, PS one twenty two in New York, and it was a hair braid. Um, interface in the gallery, like 200 feet of hair, and uh, the audience could move through, use this kind of uh, invisible machine learned orb that was around the braid in order to um, mix uh, and hear different interactions between um, recordings um, that musicians had made, uh, which was another, I won't go into all the music composition stuff, but and this was also affected and affecting these video uh, videos of these um, Lakota Fairburn agate style orb rocks. So um, this was my way of trying to synthesize all of the interviews I had done and uh, ways of making work by, by other artists and trying to move them into kind of uh, something that I um, I was already doing, but also trying to consider more deeply how these interactions could um, uh, reflect the values. So taking the ideas from these workshops, taking these ideas from the body interface, and asking um, the questions, oh, let's see, oh, they're not showing up. Um, how do I make artwork in a good way? 
Um, how do I make artwork with artificial intelligence in a good way? Um, and how can Lakota ontologies contribute to these conversations around humans and artificial intelligence? But then I wanted to ask um, other sorts of questions, like um, in certain communities, what's the ontological status of beans and materials? Um, how is something made in an ethical way in a specific community? And so again, this comes back to how I understand ontology um, and the connection between stones and artificial intelligence. So my, my grandfather, um, I'll read this quote by him. Um, he said, I believe this about stones. Whenever one comes to you, whenever it rolls to you or it's right in front of you, it's there for a purpose. There to teach your spirit something so that what it teaches you, you can use to help someone else or you can heal someone else or you can do a lot of things because um, sicknesses are a lot of times brought on by the mind. This year, they've been really teaching me so I can help younger people realize that they have something they came here um, to the physical world to do. Um, and I think this is, um, really reflects what, uh, my feeble human attempts are to interact with these stones. So, um, you know, but I still have to use com computers to try and do this. Um, I used, uh, um, I worked with Devin Ronneberg, um, to develop this touch designer software, um, in order to create a fully kind of tactilizing, sonifying, visualizing system that were that relied on each other and um, and relied on the movement of this hair braid in order to uh, both be generative and be uh, reacting to human interaction. So uh, let's see, let me play you the music. So this is the sound of somebody in the space um, moving the hair braid around um, kind of in this 360 degree sphere, um, invisible sphere. And uh, what it creates is, um, these are all improvisations. These musicians never heard each other or interacted with each other. Um, they were recordings that sent to me. Um, I gave them a kind of a, a larger structure to work with um, sonically. And I sent them a recording of me singing a song um, about rocks that's not for public consumption. And uh, then uh, they responded to that and played along with it um, in their studios and and sent it to me. And so all these interactions are kind of uh, texturally different, but um, they all sound good together because of the chordal structure. So I'll play a little bit at the end, too. <laughs> Yep. Um, so I think that's uh, what I want to say about that. I also want to say that a lot of my work um, has also been in conversation with other singers and composers, such as um, Santi Witt, who's a uh, Native American church singer. And um, I'll, I think I'll end with playing a video of him playing this uh, water drum. Um, we were in his home talking about the use of stones and metals in, um, in his um, composition practice. The guy that made it. I'm gonna skip forward. Oh, 
Um, yeah, so uh, that video, again, is an example of this, uh, all of his interactions with non-humans um, in the spirit world and in, uh, like, non-humans such as animals or birds in the physical world, um, informing him and collaborating with him in order to, for this song to be written and for it to uh, be functional um, in the uh, context that he's using it in. So I'll, I'll end with uh, this, another quote from my grandfather. Um, we were talking about the future being dangerous, and he said to me, uh, spirits and ancestors um, are just there on the other side trying to help. So it's our responsibility uh, to listen. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Wow, really, um, really amazing work that you're doing. I have a lot to think about and digest. Um, I'll just wait a little bit to see if there are any questions from the YouTube stream. Um, my own questions also, I think, are, are around, especially as you're working with AI and your thoughts on the kind of image generation, especially in the past year that has developed with um, DALI and um, stable diffusion or mid journey. Are you, and I guess one of the the practices or the rituals that we have around like this prompt generation for um, kind of machine, it could it be thought of as machine dreaming? I think with Pete Ganadol calls it machine hallucinations. And um, what your thoughts are on that kind of collaboration between the you know human and non-human and how I guess our earth and the stones or the um, materials that are driving these um, these visions and how so many people are engaging with them and creating a lot of a lot more images and kind of maybe can be considered noise or as as we kind of develop our own relationship with these images and um, how also we're able to now kind of put ourselves in the images through some of the within some of the platforms and if you've been using any of those um, those tools and what your relationship is to to that um, kind of image making platform yeah um, I've so I have a film called fever dream that I made with Devin Ronneberg and we um, are so a lot of my work is very um, I try to focus on being generative because anybody can be critical and the the world has a lot of critical voices and we actually need generative um, movement of knowledge, like we make new knowledge. So we need generative processes and ethical methodologies in order to be clear of how to do things in a um, positive way moving forward. Uh, but I, but we, I still like to do critical work and I think it's still fun and can be very funny. It's like the one place you can do fun work. And, um, uh, so we, our peace fever dream is all, I think it was GPT two and, uh, deep fakes. Like, so we have deep fakes of like Elon Musk on, um, Oh my gosh, who who do we put him on? I think some uh, you're we were conflating uh, a lot of what he was talking about with uh, different uranium mining processes and um, with, like putting Jeff Bezos on um, uh, Oppenheimer famous speech uh, and all and let's see we're trying to use every unethical AI tool we had at our hand like on hand. Um, 
to make these kind of comparisons um, between our indigenous experiences uh, being affected by um, uranium mining and, um, uh, you know, oppressive nuclear history of, of oppressive histories of nuclear warfare on us and our communities. And so that's how I used those tools. But um, I think all of the AI art visual generation is really boring. <laughs> I find it extremely boring. I, I, I think it's a fun conversation. We can return to the forever, never ending conversation of in the postmodernist world, what is art? Um, but beyond that, um, I think that they're really clever uh, to toys um, for people to, and I don't, I don't think it gets us any closer to um, whatever the goal is. I mean, some people's goal is to experience uh, intellect, like uh, human like intellectual abilities from a computer. And uh, that is because intellect is put on a pedestal in Western culture. And if intelli and intelligence is such an easy thing to give to something and then take away to say, ah, um, and that's, a, that's a, a very scary thing I see um, with uh, humans on humans as well. Like uh, um, the first, one of the big claims um, coming out of Western Europe about everybody else in the entire world was that uh, we weren't as smart as them. And that's, so that's a really easy way to oppress people. Intelligence is meaningless. Um, may, the ability to make good decisions um, uh, for many generations to come is a, is a good thing. Uh, but uh, if so, like, I, yeah, I don't even, and these, and the AI systems that where people are engaging with for fun um, right now are only replicating and moving racist things um, in like for one racism for one thing, classism, sexism, all, all of those things, because if they're built on the internet, found it, no. if they're built on the internet and the internet is racist, they're going to be racist. So mm -hmm. that's kind of how I feel about those things. Okay. Yeah. Um, I also feel that we have this innate like curiosity, um, but it can get stopped. It can, like our curiosity can be limited when a lot of our hardware is covered up by um, very like smooth and silky and shiny um, materials that, and so we don't really go deeper into questioning um, where the things come from that um, are building the machines that are producing some of these tools or toys that we can play with. And since we have this habit as Western humans to kind of use something without understanding the complexity from where it comes from, do you have any thoughts or uh, suggestions on how we kind of return to some of these objects and have a, a, a relationship of reciprocity with these machines and how is it that you're you're doing that within I mean you're doing that within your art and do you have like a do you have daily rituals or daily um, maybe not daily but um, like practices that can give and can, I guess, re give back the line of communication between the, the materials that have been extracted in, in order for you to more ethically um, have and create with the tools, with these tools? Yeah, I mean, my, my one, the, something I focus on is the fact that computers were just invented, like they were just invented. Um, we just invented them. They don't, uh, they're not permanent. Um, the decisions that we make or are made by, for us by uh, corporations are not permanent. Um, and we have the choice um, how we use them and how we continue to make things. So the... The way I approach this is, first of all, through uh, futuring practices, and which I did last year here at Camp Noggle, actually, um, uh, 
you know, indigenous futuring exercises. And um, uh, the way I think about it is that if we can tap into this ability to dream and communicate uh, again, then we can have the ability to create ethical processes. And of course, uh, this is extremely difficult and takes an extreme level of collaboration with other humans um, in order in order to do so. And it, yeah, and it's not um, a surface level interaction. It, it's going to take extreme overhaul. So, and I also want to keep in mind that um, this, it, like none of, like I, I, I get really stuck in kind of a intellectualizing of things. But um, what I mean is like, the minds from which all these things come from, um, those people need to have um, the ability to have good relationship with their land too, not just like some um, Northern Hemisphere fantasy of things being good, but like um, everywhere, there are people in indigenous to places everywhere and animals and plants and stones indigenous to everywhere and they need mm -hmm. access to the same freedom too. So, mm -hmm. um but again, we just invented computers and we can invent a different way to do the kind of communication. It's like we found this tool and we're using it and communication is good and the movement of knowledge through these stones is good, like we're doing it right now, but um, we can figure out a different way to do it that isn't um, apocalyptic. Mm -hmm. And do you find that any of these like large corporations and entities are are trying to take that approach or are they just continuing with like production for return on investment and really not trying to heal any kind of relationship with the the place or the people or the entities that, that um, these crucial materials are, are coming from? Yeah, I mean, there's no, there's, there's there's no such thing as a, yeah, as a good capitalist mm -hmm. system. So, um, but you know, that's that's why I do the work that I do just to begin the process of imagining there's a different poss there's a different possibility because we just we're doing it for millennia. Uh, we mm -hmm. don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. It's and a choice. How, how do we? how what do you think the best like way to incorporate those protocols is for some of these like larger entities how do we kind of like break them i mean i don't know i'm not an i'm not a large company i'm not i don't work for amazon or um any of the or space i don't work for any of those people um i am just an artist and uh but i can see in my community that a lot of my relatives choose not to do those things um, and uh, choose to stay home and make art <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and take care of their families and sing. And um, uh, yeah, and I think that there is, uh, a, there's been an extreme devaluing of uh, what a healthy relationship with the world looks like. And definitely. That is, you know, I, could, I, I honestly can't, sometimes cannot even imagine why people do what they do. Um, but yeah, that's why I do what I do. <laughs> yeah, it's a strange relationship also because we exist in a system and there's the like avenue that we go toward, which would be like legislative, but government is also so entangled with capitalism and it can be really hard to to imagine how we create these alternative um present systems and yeah i guess my, my 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 view on that is it's you know that that's kind of what i mean by like my community and i i think I don't know what an expert on economics would say, but I'm, I can make a strong argument that we still live outside capitalism. We have a different system in our community. We, we people don't don't live on like don't um, interact with capitalism the same way. Uh, we 
really held on to the, our practices, and a lot of communities have, even though, even though um, you know, Western European philosophy and church and oh, enslavement God. and those practices loom over and try to try to change us. Like I don't think we've changed that much. A lot of places in the world have not changed that much, but um, we still hold on our, our sovereign, our philosophical sovereignty, um, and our practices of decision making because those come from the land and the cosmos they, they don't they can never be killed off and um and again yes it's it's that's why a lot of indigenous people are anti-government they're anti-state they're anti-border they're anti-capitalist um and uh you know i like i of course i believe in i definitely believe in the many streams uh, many tributaries to a great river approach where everybody has a role to play, everybody has a process they can contribute to. Um, so uh, lawyers, uh, policymakers, technologists, art, like um, speakers, they're, they're all part of um, not just accepting, not just accepting apocalypse. Um, and the solution, no. Yeah, and, and lots of different um, approaches, many solutions, there's, no, there's not one exact exact way um i mean i like some of the stuff going on with like um climate anarchy and uh that's all all good with me yeah great well wow, really inspiring talk thank you so much for your time and this really beautiful presentation and really uh looking forward to see all the other work that you make and um, I don't think we have any more questions from the feed, probably a lot to think about. Your work is really beautiful and thank you all for coming and we hope to um, engage with you again soon. So I think that's it for us. We can both uh, leave the studio and that will be it.